Good day, grade 11. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we are going to continue with quantitative aspects of chemical change. But what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to carry on going through exam questions that I have found in old exam papers um, that were all, all, all physical science, um, grade 11 physical science government papers. So that's what we're going to do in this lesson today. So the first question says, a group of learners decides to do a titration to find the concentration of a sample of vinegar. Okay. To do the titration, they prepare 250 cubic centimeters of standard solution of sodium hydroxide of concentration 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed. It is found that during the titration, 8.5 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide reacted with four cubic centimeters of vinegar sample. The balanced chemical equation for the reaction is, they give you the CH3COOH plus sodium hydroxide gives you CH3COONA plus water. Okay, it looks quite scary, but it's not really scary formula at all for the simple reason that, first of all, it's balanced. Second of all, they've told you what they were, they, they've reacted together. They said to do this, they used a standard concentration of sodium hydroxide and they reacted with the ethanoic acid, okay, or the vinegar sample, All right. Not says the balanced chemical equation, the reaction is this. It says give an investigative question for this investigation. Okay, grade 11, so the first, first, first thing you need to know is that the most important thing is that um, your investigative question has to have a question mark at the end of it. It seems, sounds like such a silly thing to say, but the number of exam papers that I have marked in my many years of teaching, as well as both for nationals, as well as for my schools, the number of times students write a statement and they've all a question and they forget to put a question mark at the end of it. And we, guys, there is a mark allocated for a question, not for a statement. So there has to be a question mark at the end of it, okay? Secondly, you obviously have to be asking a question. And then the way this works is that there isn't strictly a wrong answer. But you obviously your question has to relate the variables that are being studied. Yeah. Okay. It says in a group of learners decides to do a titration to find the concentration of a sample of vinegar. Okay. So the investigative question here is pretty easy. It would be what is the concentration of the sample of vinegar? Or it could be how can we determine the sample of vinegar, or can we use a titration to find the concentration of a sample of vinegar? But the concentration of the sample of vinegar are your keywords there, okay? What is the scientific name of vinegar? This is kind of cheating because um, you guys only do, officially, only do organic chemistry in grade 12. Um, and the official name for vinegar is ethanoic acid, which you should only know in grade 12 when you do your organic chemistry. So don't panic too much if you don't know that, okay? Now it says calculate the concentration of the vinegar sample. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite my equation over here so that I've got space to write underneath it. I've got CH3COOH plus NaOH goes to CH3 Kuna plus water. Okay, so what do they tell us? They tell us that they prepare 250 cubic centimeters standard solution. So we've got 250 cubic centimeters standard solution of concentration 0.2 moles. Okay, it is found that during titration, 8.5 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 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 just let me erase something. This is what was prepared, 250 cubic centimeters of concentration 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed, okay? Now they say, now they say, during the titration, 
8.5 cubic centimeters of the sodium hydroxide. So they only use 8.5 cubic centimeters. We acted with four cubic centimeters of the vinegar solution and it says the balanced chemical equation so if you look on your formula sheets and guys i've told you a million times already with these lessons that you really need to have your formula sheets with you at all times and what you'll find is that oh i don't know what happened there what you'll find is there's a formula that says c a v a over c b v b is equal to n a over NB, NA over NB, okay, CAVA over CBVB is equal to N over NB, where N stands for number of moles of acid, N stands of B stands for number of moles of the base, and if you can look, see here, yeah, it's quite easy, because this is a ratio of 1 to 1, this is the concentration of the acid, that's the volume of the acid, this is the concentration of the base, and this is the volume of the base. Now, normally, normally I would say to you that you need to change, or we need to change these volumes to decimeters cubed. But in this case, we don't need to do that. And the simple reason is that it's going to be a ratio. We're going to be dividing volume by volume, so the units are going to cancel. Okay, so let us substitute in and solve for what they want. And what do they want? They want the concentration. They want this concentration. Right, so we've got the concentration of the acid is what we want. The volume of the acid is 4. They told us that. All over the concentration of the base they told us was 0,2. We used 8,5 cubic centimeters, and the ratio of the moles is 1 to 1, so it's just 1. So do you agree we can say that Ca is equal to the concentration of the acid, is equal to 0, 0,2 multiplied by 8,5 all divided by 4. All I've done is cross multiply that times there and divide it there. So let's get at our calculator and let us work this out. So we've got 0 0.2 multiplied by 8.5 equals, and then we're going to divide that by 4, and then we're going to press the SD button, and that becomes 0 0.43. So the concentration of the acid is 0 0.4. Let me just check that again. It is 0.43 because we are looking to round up to two decimal places. So you look at the third place and that's a five, so it's 0 0.43. So it's 0 0.43 moles per decimeter cubed. Get it? 0 0.43 moles per decimeter cubed. Okay, now it says a certain antacid tablet contains magnesium carbonate. When taken, the antacid neutralizes an excess hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between magnesium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. Okay, so what this react with question is actually doing is testing to know whether or not you know your um, equations and how they work together and what you should know is that a carbonate plus an acid always gives you a carbon dioxide, a salt of some form and a water. That is what always happens when you have a carbon dioxide and an acid. You get a carbon dioxide, salt and water. So let's write this out. We've got magnesium carbonate. Oh, it irritates me when this does it. Sorry. Magnesium carbonate plus what have we got? Hydrochloric acid, HCl. So what salt we're going to form? It's always just the first and the last. But magnesium is in group two. So therefore magnesium is going to need two chlorines. So it's MgCl2 plus carbon dioxide plus water. If you guys struggle with this, okay, 
all that you need to do is, I mean, as in what the salt will be, let me show you a different way of doing it. What you do is you know that it's got carbon dioxide and water, right? So then you think, okay, fine, well, I've used up the carbon dioxide and I've used up the hydrogen. What's left? Well, we've obviously got magnesium and chlorine. And the magnesium, like I said, is in group two and chlorine is in group seven. So therefore, it's MgCl2. Now we need to balance, okay? Because they've asked us to write a balanced chemical equation. So there's one magnesium and there's one magnesium, one carbon, one carbon, three oxygens, one, two, three oxygens. There's one hydrogen here, but there are two hydrogens here. So if I put a two here, I now have two hydrogens, but I've also got two chlorines, which works because we've got two chlorines there. So there you go. That is now the beautiful balanced equation for the reaction between magnesium carbonate and, hyd magnesium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. Now it says, why is there a tendency to burp when acids are taken? The studio. It's the same reason why you burp when, same reason, yeah, why you burp when you are drinking uh, fizzy cool drinks like your Coca Cola and stuff. It's because of the carbon dioxide gas. Okay, just that. Carbon dioxide gas makes you burp, especially because there's an increased concentration of carbon dioxide in your system. Right, next question. It says, define the term molar mass of the substance. Okay, now guys, you need to go and ask your teachers for the exam guidelines or the CAPS document, and they've got the formal definitions of all these things like molar mass, empirical formula, and everything else, okay? And you need to learn them word perfect. But effectively, the molar mass is what? It is the mass of one mole of the substance, okay, which is what? Equivalent to having the same number of particles as there are in one to the carbon to, which is Avogadro's constant. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, the molar mass of a substance is the mass of a substance which has got 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 elementary particles in it. There you go. Calculate the number of moles of water in 100 grams of water. Okay, well, number of moles is mass over the molar mass. The mass uh, that we're given is 100. The molar mass of water is 2 plus 16. Why is it 2? Because hydrogen is 1, but there are 2 atoms of hydrogen in water. So that becomes 18. So it's just 100 divided by 18. So we need a calculator because I don't know what 100 divided by 18 is. And that is 5.56. Why is it 6? Because we're rounding up. Okay, so that becomes 5,56 moles. Right, now Methyl benzoate is a compound used in the manufacture of perfumes. It is found that 5,325 grams of a sample of methyl benzoate contains 3,75 grams of carbon, 0,316 grams of hydrogen, and 1,25 grams of oxygen. Okay. It says define the term empirical formula. So empirical formula is just the basic ratio of the elements in a part in, in a in a molecule. Okay. Right, so now it says determine the empirical a formula of methyl benzoate. Okay, so the total sample is 5,325 grams. Okay, out of that, carbon is 3,758 grams. Hydrogen makes up 0,316 grams. And oxygen makes up 1,251 grams. 
Okay, so do you see that we can actually convert these to percentages? We can work out the percentage of carbon, the percentage of hydrogen, and the percentage of oxygen. We can divide each of these by the total and times by 100 over 1, and we can get the percentage of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It's actually a very nice question because usually what happens is they start you off with percentages, and then you pretend it's 100 grams, and then you work it through. Now we've been given something where we actually have to convert these to percentages before we can work with it okay so let's do that so we're going to take this 3 comma 7 5 8 we're going to divide it by 5 comma 3 2 5 and times it by 100 over 1 we're going to take 0 comma 3 1 6 over 5 comma 3 2 5 and time is about 100 over 1 and we're going to take 1 comma 2 5 1 over 5 comma 3 to 5 and times by 100 over 1. So we're going to find the percentages of each of these and then we're going to write it up here because we're running out of space. Okay, so let's work out the percentages. Okay, start on the side. So we've got 3.758 divided by 5.325 equals times by 100 equals that's 70,57%. So 70,57%, these are percentages, of the compound is made of carbon. Okay. 0,316 divided by 5.325 times by 100 equals 5,93. 5,93% of this compound is hydrogen. And then we've got 1.25, 1.25, hmm, 1 divided by 5.325 equals, oh, sorry, times by 100 equals 23.49, so it's 23,49%. Okay, so those are our percentages. And now you can do this like normal. So what we do to give, we pretend that this is 100 grams. We're going to divide by the molar mass to find the number of moles and then so on and so on. Okay, so we're going to divide this by 12, this by 1, and this by 16, because those are the molar masses. This obviously remains 5,93. Let's work out what 70.70.57 divided by 12 is 5.88, it's close, 5.88, and 23.49 divided by 16 is not going to be 5, is 1,47, 1,47. So in the embryo, the rule is now, now we divide this all by the smallest number to get a basic ratio. So we need to divide this by 1, 47, this by 1, 47, and this by 1, 47. That's obviously 1. So now let's do 5, oopsie, 0.93 divided by 1.47. And we press the SE button and it's 4.03. That's 4,03. And let's just do this one as well. 5.88 divided by 1.47 is going to be 4, exactly 4. So therefore, I would say the ratio is C4, H4, O. Okay, so this is the formula. C4H4O is the formula for methyl benzoate. Interesting, hey? Now that is the empirical formula. Now they say if the molar mass is meth of methyl benzoate is 136, what is the molecular formula? So do you agree that we have worked out the empirical formula? And the empirical formula is just going that for every four carbons, there are four hydrogens and one oxygen atom. 
Okay, that's what the empirical formula is saying. Now we're going to see what the molecular formula is saying. So what the molecular formula would be. So the way we do this is we work out what this molar mass is or formula mass is. So that is going to be 4 times 12 plus 4 times 1 plus 16. Okay, that is the molar mass of this thing. This is going to be M of C4H4O. So 4 times 12 is 48, plus 4, plus 16. That's 20, that's going to be 68. That 68 grams is the molar mass of C4H4O. But they're asking about 136 grams per mole, which is double this. If I times this by 2, what do I get? I get 2 to 16, and that becomes 136. So that means that this methyl benzoate is actually twice the size of what I've got. So the molecular formula, the actual formula of methyl benzoate is actually C8H8O2. Okay, if you didn't realize this, you could have actually gone 136 divided by 68 and you would have gone 2 and then gone, ah, well, we need to double the size of this, which is C8H8O2. Okay. Right, let's do another example. So we're talking about what a limiting reagent is. Okay, a limiting reagent is the one that's going to be used up first and it defines or determines how, how much product is made. Okay, so it's the one, the reagent that is used, the reactant that is used up first, and it's the one that determines the amount of product produced. Now it says, iron, Fe, reacts with sulfur, S, to form iron sulfide, FeS, according to the following balance equation. Awesome. Now it says, calculate which of the two substances will be used up completely if 20 grams of Fe and 10 grams of sulfur are mixed and heated. Okay, so the only way we can do this is if we actually work out the number of moles this gives us and the number of moles this gives us, okay? We know that theoretically the ratio is one to one. So one mole of iron requires one mole of sulfur. Two moles of iron requires two moles of sulfur. 353 moles of iron requires 353 moles of sulfur. Okay, get it? So what we need to do is work out which of these is the smaller number and when it comes to moles. So number of moles is mass over the molar mass. Okay, so the number of moles of Fe is going to be the mass, which is 20 grams, divided by the molar mass of ion, iron, not ion, iron, which is 55,85, which is 55,85. Okay, don't panic if your formula in your periodic table says 56. Just use which if, whatever your periodic table tells you. So that gives us 0.36, okay. So we're given 0.36 of iron. Now let's work out the number of moles of sulfur. That's gonna be 10 over 32. So let's work out what that is. 10 divided by 32 equals 0.31. So that is 0,31. So by a hair, we're going to use up sulfur first, but very small amount. Okay, sulfur is going to be used up first. So the answer is sulfur. Then it says, but how many grams of the other substance are in excess? Okay, so do you agree that the number of moles of Fe in excess is actually just going to be 0, 0, 0,5 moles, okay? This is 0 0.36, this is 0 0.31. So the difference is 0 0.05, okay? So therefore we can say, well, the mass is gonna be the number of moles times the molar mass, which is 0, 0, 0,05 times by 55,85. So let's do that. So that's 0 0.05 multiplied by 55.85, 55 
which is 2.79 grams. 2,79 grams. Okay, let me explain that again to you. This is the limiting reagent because it's going to be used up first because it's got the smallest amount. So 0.31 moles of sulfur is going to react with 0.31 moles of iron, right? Which means that how many moles of iron are left? It's obviously 0.05. But now they didn't ask for the number of moles left over. They asked for the mass. So therefore we can go mass is number of moles times the molar mass, which is 0.05 times that, which gives you 2,79. So that would be 2,79 grams. Okay, now new question. It says magnesium burns in air to form magnesium oxide. According to the following balance equation, two magnesium plus oxygen gives me magnesium oxide. It says, if the percentage yield of this reaction is only 80%, calculate the mass of the magnesium that needs to be burned to produce 30 grams of magnesium oxide. Okay, so we need, we want to know how much magnesium we, we have to burn in order to produce 30, 30 grams. But 30 grams, 30 grams, equals only 80%. Okay, so what we first need to do is work out how many moles that is. Okay, so let's do that. So the number of moles is mass over molar mass, which is 30 divided by the molar mass of magnesium oxide. So magnesium is 24 plus 16, that's magnesium oxide which is 30 divided by 40, which is 0, 0.75 moles. Okay, but that is equal to 80%. Okay, it's only 80% has been yielded, okay? So to get what, what should happen, get what we need, we need to find out what the total amount would be. So the easiest way to do that is to take a 0.75 and you multiply it by 100 over 80. What you're doing effectively is dividing this by 80%, okay, to get what 1% is worth, and then multiplying it by 100 to get 100%, okay? So this cancels with this, this cancels with that to give you 5 over 4, and now you just need a calculator. So it's 0.75 times 5 divided by 4, mm. divided by 4, 4 equals 0, 0,94, okay? So we actually should have produced, should have produced 0, 0,94 moles, okay, if this had been 100% efficient. Which means that since the ratio is 2 to 2, which means the ratio is 1 to 1, we need 0.94 moles of magnesium, right? That's what we need. But the number of moles is mass over molar mass, and they've asked us to calculate the mass of the magnesium. So therefore, the mass is going to be the number of moles, which is 0.94, multiplied by the molar mass of magnesium, which is 24. So let's get that out. So we've got 24 times 0 0.94 equals 22.56 grams. So we need 22.56 grams to get out 30 of magnesium, of the magnesium, to get out 30 grams of magnesium oxide. Okay, right, I hope you understand that. Let's look at this question. Okay, so you can see that we're doing a whole bunch of different types of effectively stoichiometric questions, okay? Um, and It's important that you're able to do stoichiometry. The weird thing is that although it's a really big part of grade 11, it doesn't play a huge part in grade 12, um, except for when you use it in titrations and acids and bases. 
But what's interesting is that if you go on to do chemistry in first year, a huge part of first year chemistry is also geometry again. So it's very important that you need to know that you know how to do this. Okay. Okay, so it says aluminium sulfate is used as a coagulant in water purification. A coagulant is something that basically pulls things together so that they will sink down to the bottom. Okay, so it reacts with sodium hydroxide to form aluminium hydroxide, which drags impurities as it settles. Okay, understand. So it actually forms, it's quite cool, it takes your aluminium sulfate, reacts with sodium hydroxide, it forms a precipitate, aluminium hydroxide, but when it does that, it actually causes the impurities to settle with it and then there's sodium sulfate left in the solution. A chemist at a water purification plant adds, adds 700 grams of aluminium sulfate to a sample of water. It says calculate the maximum mass of aluminium hydroxide that can be produced from the mass of aluminium to aluminium sulfate. Okay. So they want the maximum mass. So what they're doing is assuming that there is no, and um, that the efficiency is 100%. That's what they're assuming. Okay. So we're looking at 700 grams of this, and they want to know how much it makes of this. Okay. But we don't work in grams. What are we working? We work in moles. So we need to find the number of moles of this. Okay. So number of moles is mass over the molar mass. So before we can do this, we need to work out the molar mass of aluminium sulfate. Okay, which is quite a big one. Right, so let's write it over here. M of aluminium to SO4-3 is going to be 2 times aluminium which is 27 plus, and let's do this properly, sulfur is 32 plus 4 times 16 for oxygen, and we have to multiply that all by 3. Okay, right. So that becomes 54 plus 4 times 16 is 64. So it's 32 plus 64 multiplied by 3, which is 54 plus 96 times 3. And at this point, I might as well do the calculator here. So we've got 32 plus 64 equals 96 times 3 equals plus 54 equals 342. So that equals 342. So now we've got the molar mass of aluminium sulfate, which is 342. So now we can get the number of moles. Number of moles is mass, which is 700, over the mass of molar mass of 342. And that is going to give us what? 700 divided by 342 is 2.05 moles, 2,05 moles. So we have got 2,05 moles of aluminium sulfate. But let's reread the question. It says calculate the maximum mass of aluminium hydroxide. Right, so obviously if we have 2.05 moles of this, we have to look at the mole ratio. So if we look at this, we can see that one mole of aluminium to sulfate goes to two moles of aluminium hydroxide. Two moles, right? So if we have 2,05 moles of aluminium sulfate, we're going to have to multiply that by two to find the actual number of moles of aluminium hydroxide, which is going to be 4,1 moles. So we've now got 4.1 moles of aluminium hydroxide, okay, because it's a ratio of 1 to 2, okay? Right, now we want the mass. And again, number of moles is equal to mass over molar mass. So we need to get the molar mass 
of aluminium hydroxide. Aluminium hydroxide, right? So let's work that out. So aluminium again is 27 plus three times the hydroxide, which is 16 plus one which is 27 plus 3 times 17. And then what we need is our calculator. So we're going to go 27 times bracket 3 times 17. Close bracket equals, oh, no wonder there was a times instead of a plus. Let's go back up. Um, do, 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 do. And delete, make that a plus equals. 78. So the molar mass of aluminium is 78, right? So therefore we can find the number of moles of aluminium hydroxide by going 78 multiplied by 4,1. So if we do that, we multiply it by 4 by 4.1 and we equal to 319,8. 319.8. So that's 319,8 moles. Interesting, hey? So we now know that the, I mean, not moles. Oh, what have I done? No. I found the mass. I have found the mass. The mass of the, sorry, is 319,8. 319,8 grams. We have found 319,8 grams. Sorry, I lost track for a minute. Yeah, we found the molar mass. This is moles per the moles per um, this is grams per mole. Grams per mole. Yeah, we have the number of moles. So we've taken the 78 grams per mole and multiplied it by the moles to give us 319.8 grams, which is the amount of grams that are required, I mean, that you'll eventually end up of aluminium hydroxide from the 700 grams of aluminium sulfate. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start this point here, okay? We're going to start here at this point in our next lesson, which is on Tuesday next week. Have a great day, grade 11s.